Praise the Lord. In the Old Testament, the book of Ezekiel, if you'll look there with me, I want to read just a few verses in Ezekiel 36. Ezekiel 36. These are wonderful verses. I actually read them a couple of Wednesday nights ago, or part of these verses. We want to look at this example, this prophetic word concerning how God uh, has promised to work in the lives of people. Amen. This is Ezekiel 36, beginning with verse 24. For I will take you from among the heathen, and gather you out of all countries, and will bring you into your own land. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you. You shall be clean from all your filthiness, from all of your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you an heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. And ye shall keep my judgments and do them. Amen. What a wonderful word. Some of you, no doubt most of us here today, have uh, had that kind of an encounter with Jesus Christ. And that is that before we knew him, our hearts were hardened, they were unresponsive, Um, We were disinterested in uh, the things of God, the Word of God. Spiritual things didn't mean anything to us. The Bible says that those that are out there in the world, those that are in their sin, uh, those that are of the flesh, living after the flesh, they can't comprehend or understand the things of the Spirit. Amen. It's only uh, as a person becomes born again of the Spirit that you become a new person And you see God and you see the Word of God in a completely new light. And Ezekiel prophesied describing the kind of things that he, that God would do, that he would remove, uh, he would sprinkle clean water upon you, that there would be a a cleansing that would take place. And uh, that all the filthiness of your idols, all of these things would be cleansed and removed from your, your life. And he said, I'll give you a new heart and I will put my spirit within you. And so he's given you a heart that can respond to God. He's given you his Holy Spirit. It causes you to be able to to understand and to to comprehend what God uh, is doing in your life. And I'm so thankful for the reality of conversion. Amen. To be born again. Most of us here this morning can give the testimony of the day, of the time, of the place that you were at when you you met the Lord and you had a heart change and a life change and a whole direction change uh, that resulted from your just your coming to Jesus Christ in faith and confidence uh, uh, in in the Lord. There's uh, the song, and I mentioned this song a couple of weeks ago when I read these scriptures. It came to my mind. It's an old song that says, "What a wonderful." Change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. I have light in my soul for which long I have sought since Jesus came into my heart. Amen. So there's the cleansing work. And then there's the transformation that takes place in the life of a person. A new heart and a new spirit. A complete change that takes place. And that happens when you are born again of the Spirit, when you become truly converted. I've noticed um, that a lot of people these days, they use the term uh, when they describe themselves. I don't know if it's they just want to be cool or, or what it is. There's a whole lot of people who are interested in trying to be cool. And um, But instead of saying, I'm a Christian, they're saying, I'm a Christ follower. I'm a Christ follower. Well, as I understand it and reading the Bible, studying the Bible about following Jesus and discipleship and what it means to follow the Lord, I'm convinced that a lot of people don't even know what they're saying when they say, I am a Christ follower. If you're a Christ follower, then that means that you you have decided that He is going to be the one that you're going to follow. 
You're going to follow His example. You're going to listen to His voice. You're going to shut out all the other voices and you're going to be focused upon uh, the teachings uh, of, uh, uh, of Jesus. You're a disciple, a follower of Jesus Christ. That means that you've left your old life and now you're following after the Lord Jesus Christ. You understand that the, that, uh, the experience with God is many places in the Scripture it is uh, characterized as a walk with God. It's hard for us in America to really think about it or comprehend this because very few people walk. If they walk, it's because they're intentionally walking for their, for their uh, health. It's for exercising or whatever. But in many places, if you visit other nations of the world, in Eastern Europe, in India, in Africa, in Central America, South America, all of these nations, what you'll notice that's much different than what goes on here in the United States of America is that Everybody walks a lot. And many of them do not have vehicles. If they do, a lot of times they can't afford the fuel. And so they walk. And they're not just walking for their exercise. They're not doing that at all. They're walking because it's their life. They walk to their job. They walk to their work. They walk together in food. They walk to school. They walk. It's their daily existence. Walking, walking everywhere that they go. And so they don't go for a walk as something that, you know, and something nice to do for exercise. They do it because it's the necessity. It is, it's their existence. It's their life. And do you understand that whenever in the Word of God it describes uh, uh, that our, our, it compares our Christian life to our walk, it's not just taking a walk. It's not just something we do just for convenience sake or for to advantage us in some way, whenever the Word of God describes the Christian walk, it is our life. It is to be our life. So many places in the Scripture, it says that we're to walk in love. It says we're to walk humbly before God. It says we're to walk in the light. It says we're to walk by faith and not by sight. It says we're to walk honestly before God. It says we're to walk in the Spirit that we won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. It says we're to walk worthy of our vocation. It says we're to walk circumspectly. And I'm just naming just a few. All through the Word of God, you'll see this, this uh, example that's given to us that our Christian experience is compared to a walk of life. Amen. Enoch is one example. The Bible says that he walked with God and that just means that he was with him and, and he was uh, walking in fellowship with him and following the, the will of God and the plan of God for his life. And he walked with God and he was not for God took him. We know that Enoch is a type of the church. Believers are to be in that kind of a walk. We're to be walking and living faithfully to the Lord because we live in an expectancy that one day very, very soon, one of these days, that there are going to be those Christians who inhabit this planet who are not going to go by way of the grave, but they are going to escape this world by way of the rapture or the catching away of the church. Amen. Are you with me this morning? Enoch walked with God and was not for God took him. Took him away. And that's the kind of life that you're to live. That's the kind of life that I'm to live. Our Christian uh, experience needs to be a walk with God. Amen. So when Jesus called His disciples and said, leave your nets, leave your boats, leave your occupation, leave it all behind and come and follow Me, He wasn't saying to them, let's go for a nice walk up the beach. He wasn't saying that. He was saying, leave it all behind. That was your life, but it's not going to be your life. This is what you were, but I'm going to make you. I'm going to transform you. I'm going to make you into... Fishers of men. I'm going to transform your life. And the call to Christianity, to call, the call to follow the Lord, I think that just as we misunderstand in America the whole idea of what the walk is all about, almost every other nation of the world understands that your walk is your life. But in America, a walk is just a convenience. A walk is just a nice thing that we do. It's just, you know, uh, for just a little physical exercise, 
Just take a little walk. You might walk around your street or walk in the neighborhood or go someplace to take a, a walk. And that's all well and good. But that's not a good comparison when we talk uh, to, uh, about what the Bible is describing as our Christian walk. It is our life. I think that there's a, there's a disconnect in our country. There's a terrible disconnect in our nation today between what we believe or what we profess and what we do and how we live. There's a disconnect. There has to be because most of the polls, most of the research shows that the majority, a large majority, some say as many as 80% of Americans when asked say, yes, I'm a Christian. But out of that great percentage, less than half of them are regularly attending church Less than half of them believe that the Bible is infallible. Uh, almost uh, uh, half of them, their beliefs, their lifestyles uh, cannot be distinguished between themselves and the world. There's no different. They do everything that the world does. They live by the same standard, by the same philosophy of the world, even though they say, yes, I'm a Christian. And a big part of the problem is that they have totally lost uh, the understanding and, and, and missed the truth of the Word of God that our walk with God is our life and that our old life disappears. It's gone. We're set free from that old life and as we become Christians, we're followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is our identity. That's who we are. And so it's a, it's a sad time. It's a dangerous time. I mean, even, even our president who professes to be a born-again Christian and identifies him someone as a follower of Jesus Christ. There's a disconnect there because someone that is a follower of Jesus Christ, they would never go against other parts of the Word of God. They would never defend uh, what's going on in our nation and what happened this week and make calls congratulating groups of people across the country on the decisions that are being made uh, to open perversion and to the acceptance of same-sex marriage. And I, I'm not I'm not falling out with uh, Barack Obama. I'm not trying to... Uh, I believe it's important that we honor the office of the president and that we pray for the president. But I have to tell you, in our nation right now, a lot of people are following that same philosophy. Yes, I believe in Jesus Christ, but there's this big disconnect between what they say and they profess and, and what they're doing and how they are living. Our Christian walk has to be by the Word of God. Amen. It's not what's convenient for me. It's not my opinion. One of the problems with, that we have in the United States Supreme Court right now is that men have been elevated to a position that their opinion is higher, it's, it's honored higher than God's law. And when you get into a position like this, it doesn't matter if you're Chief Justice Roberts. It doesn't matter if you're who, who that you, who you are and how brilliant you are and how, uh, how great uh, of a, a person, a student of the law that you are. When you make decisions um, that are going to go against the law of God and destroy uh, the nation and to destroy marriages, but defined by the Word of God, doesn't matter how much that you say that you honor God or that you are a follower of Jesus Christ. There is a disconnect there and a problem that we have in our nation today. A lot of people that I come in contact with will say, yes, I'm a Christian. But I think a lot of people don't even understand what the Bible is describing when it says that we are a Christian. And there's a lot of deception that's going on. A lot of deception. But the Bible says that that's something that would characterize the last days. As we get closer and closer to these last moments of time, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 says, the, When the wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders, the wicked, the Antichrist, and the spirit of, of the Antichrist of these last days. 2 Timothy 2 and 10, it says, And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. Why? Because they received not the love of the truth. There is the connection, and has to be, the understanding 
that if a person professes to know the Lord and to be a Christian and they do not the word, the things that God has commanded us to do, then something happened. It may have been some religious thing that happened to your life. You may have had some awakening uh, uh, about uh, uh, or some religious thing in your life, uh, but you didn't get saved. You didn't get born again. Because if you're truly born again, Ezekiel prophesied about what would happen in the life of a person who truly gets born again. The old stony heart is removed. And now you're responsive to God and to the things of God. You're interested in spiritual things. You have a new heart that uh, becomes uh, uh, pliable and responsive and interested and hungry for the things of God. Amen. You have a new spirit that's in you that causes you to love God and love the things of God. You're not rejecting the Word of God. You're changed by the Word of God. There's a real problem of deception uh, today. And the real root of the problem of the deception is this deceivableness of unrighteousness that affects our nation today has come because they have received not the love of the truth. They don't love the truth. They hate the truth. They despise it. They make a mockery of it. Preachers are the prime target today uh, for mockery. Conservatives who believe in godly principles are the prime target of mockery. And all the, the major media outlets, that's what they do. They make fun of people who stand for righteousness. And they have neglected and turned away from the truth. This is a nation who has a heritage. We have a heritage of that is Christian, it is biblically based. You can't walk through the halls of Congress. You can't go into the Supreme Court buildings. You can't go anywhere in Washington where you do not see the continual reminder of the fact that this nation was founded on the Word of God. And right in the halls of the, uh, uh, that was originally established honoring God is where all these wicked and ungodly decisions are being made. And they see the truth, but they, it's, uh, they're rejecting the truth, and it's because they don't love the truth that, that they're being deceived. They're deceived. They're taken in by darkness. Now, I don't believe that these senators or the president or, or uh, the Supreme Court justices, I don't think that their intention is, I want to destroy America. I really don't believe that. I believe that what they're wanting, that they really think they're doing what's the best for the nation. They're convinced that this whole thing of same-sex marriage is a civil right. They believe that. And why do they believe it? Because they have rejected the Word of God. They have rejected God's Word. And so they're sucked in uh, to this spirit of deception that's in our world today. Let's read on here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. For this cause... God shall send them strong delusion. Now the word there, the term strong delusion, from the, from the, the Greek language, it means the, the energy of deceit. The energy of deceit. It just means that God, because they reject God or they reject the law of God, then God pulls back. He pulls back from them. And when that happens, then there's this, there's this wicked, evil spirit of deceit that comes in and it blinds the minds of people. And we're faced with that in our nation right now. A whole group of people that are leading and setting the direction of our our nation who are spiritually blinded and deceived. It's a sad, sad time. God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. And that's what they're doing. They're believing a lie. When When the truth is rejected, the only thing that can happen is that The lie takes over. Deception takes over. And that's where we are in our nation today. One of the main reasons why we're experiencing it is because Christians and the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are not walking as we have been commanded to walk. We are not walking as we have been commanded to walk. You see, today there are all kinds of Deceivers, imposters, uh, all kinds of people today that are they're taken in uh, by the spirit uh, of of the age. And Jesus warned about these last days in Matthew 24. He warned four times about deception. 
about deception. Take heed that no man deceive you. And then four, three other times in that text in Matthew 24, it all describes that one of the main factors of the last days would be a spirit of deception. And the only thing that can counter it is the spirit of truth. The only thing that can counter it is the spirit of truth. It's as you live out the life of Christ. As you live according to the Word of God. And you're, you don't compromise your, your commitments and your convictions, but you stand in the face of all that is happening in our world today with strength and conviction. Not just your opinion, but you stand upon the Word of the Lord. Take heed that no man deceive you. Take heed that no man deceive you. You say, well... So thankful we can be in the church because that's a place where we're, we can be protected from deception. Oh no. Not true. Do you think that the enemy is going to be stopped by the doors of a church? No. The enemy wants to come right into the church. He wants to affect every husband, every wife, every young person, every preacher, every one of us. That spirit of deception, he wants to influence the way that we think. Amen. So if you spend all of your time consumed with the things of the world and what the world is doing and the way the world is thinking, you're, don't be surprised if you don't start to get a little weak in your stand, in your position. Amen. Stay with the truth of God's Word. The Scripture says that really the, the power of the Word of God is only really realized when it's lived out. It's lived out. I believe in the power of the spoken Word. I believe it needs to be preached. It needs to be taught. I understand that. But the real influence, the real power of God's Word is when it's lived out in our lives every day. Amen. James 1.22 But be ye doers of the Word and not hearers only deceiving your own selves. It's pretty clear, isn't it? You, are, you, you, you slip into deception when you're only a hearer and you don't act it out. You don't live it out every day in your life that you're a Christian wherever you go, out in, your, in the workplace and, and those that you rub shoulders with every day, your, your, your community, your neighborhood, your business associates, whoever that you're involved in with every day. It's you are a testimony of Jesus Christ and you live it out every day in your life. Amen. That's when the world takes notice of it. That's when it has its impact upon the world around us. To be a doer of the Word, not a hearer only. When you do that, you deceive yourself. So how is it possible that we could, we could find it? Uh, ourselves in a predicament in our world today. Let me tell you, there's not just a few preachers, but there is there is a there there is a a group of preachers today who are teaching and who have espoused just what the Supreme Court have allowed this week. They're they're allowing it. They're they're teaching it as as acceptable. Major people. I'm talking about people who write books and people that have had influence in churches. It's far-reaching. The United Pentecostal Church, the Oneness uh, Pentecostals, they have had a, an entire group that has broke away from them and they have an entire church that's made up of people who are living in that perverted lifestyle and they defend it. They have an annual convention uh, where they sing and they preach. And what's interesting, you know, the UPC, uh, the Oneness Pentecostals, have always been known for their very conservative looks and uh, holiness lifestyle as far as appearance is concerned. You know that many of these people that have slipped into that this, this foolishness uh, uh, of this terrible lifestyle, they still have the outward appearance. Now, it's not worth much. It's not worth anything. Because they're just, they've, they've been deceived. They've been taken in by a spirit of deception. And where did that spirit of deception come from? It came because they rejected the truth. They loved not the truth. Deception comes when you are a hearer only and you don't allow it to become a part of your walk. It doesn't become a part of your life. When it's your walk, the daily experience, the daily walk that you have with Jesus Christ, when the Word influences that, then you 
are going to have an impact in our world. Amen. What can be done? Well, obviously, the church needs to go to prayer. But one of the most important things that needs to take place in the church and among uh, uh, people who profess to know Jesus Christ is we need to get back to the basics of repentance. Just old-fashioned repentance. Amen. Because it really, that's where it all begins with, with Jesus Christ. A lot of people thought they became a Christian just because they started going to church for an hour a week. Or maybe they read the Bible some or sang some Christian songs. They, they have been deceived into thinking, I must be a Christian because I'm doing all these Christian things. But we know that that's not the truth. When Jesus stepped on the scene just before He did, the forerunner was John the Baptist, the forerunner of Jesus, and His message in a nutshell was, Repent! Repent! For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus, He steps on the scene. His ministry was just that. Repent! 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 And then when the first message was preached there on the... Uh, in the book of Acts chapter 2, when Peter stood up to preach that message that day, what was his message? Repent. He told them, just as John did and just as the Lord Jesus did, he told them to repent, to confess of their sins and allow God to change their life. Amen. Repentance is uh, the basic doctrine that is forsaken and omitted much among many, many churches today. Repentance has to do with your willingness to allow Christ to transform your life, to transform your heart, to transform your mind and your life, the direction of your life. The word literally means to turn around or an about face, that you've been going this direction, but when you come into this encounter with Jesus Christ, your, your life has changed, your mind has changed, your heart has changed, and you make a turn. You're not going that way no more. You're now going to follow Jesus Christ. It means everything is new. You're going in a complete new direction with your life. You're not just adding Jesus to your lifestyle like He's a walk. Just a convenient little walk. No, whenever you turn and you repent of your sins and confess your sins before Jesus Christ, there is a supernatural a transformation that takes place in your heart, as Ezekiel said. I'll give you a new heart. I'll give you a new mind. I'll change you. I'll cause you to love the things of God that you used to hate and despise. I'll cause you to want to follow God that you used to want to go in your own way, but now you'll turn around and you'll go in a complete new direction. So repentance needs to be brought back to uh, uh, the, the forefront of evangelism and soul winning, and reaching out to the lost. So many times we think, well, what they need is just someone to care about them, or oh, we just need to nurture them and help them, or maybe give them some food, or, you know, our, our responsibility, while it's, there's nothing wrong with, uh, with meeting the, the immediate need or, or uh, the social part, uh, I understand that, there, that that does play a part, but it's, it's not what is needed. What they need is a change of mind, a change of heart, a transformation that only can come by the Spirit of God. A new direction where you love the things that you used to hate. Your thinking is different. You don't think like you used to think. You were uh, thinking after the, the wisdom of this world and the wisdom of men, but now you're, you're, you've received the truth and, and you love the truth and your, your, your life is occupied with the wisdom of God. What you believe is different. How you live is different. How you walk is different. Amen. Amen. And so if you're going to walk differently, that just means that your, your life every day, the way it's lived out in your life, is different. Amen. You just don't do like the world does. You don't love the world and you don't, you don't live like the world. Amen. The times over the years that I've worked on public jobs... It took them about two or three days to figure it out. Almost in every job that I had, by about the third or fourth day, I would get the name preacher. You're the preacher. And, uh, and I would always get the apologies, you know, when they would go through a string of curse words or start to tell some uh, bad story or, or do something. Then they would always turn to me and say, sorry, preacher, 
Sorry, preacher. And uh, it kind of irritated me and bothered me sometimes, but I, I have to, to say that I'm, I'm thankful that at least there was an, enough of Jesus shining through that they knew what I was and what I believed in. Amen. <laughs> Glory to God. Thank God for the change that can come into your life. And you can be transformed and even the way that you think and your whole philosophy is different. I would also be the one that they would call on. It didn't matter what was going on. I mean, if they needed something from God, they would call the preacher. And this was in two summer jobs that I had and the job that I had here in Law County. They would, they would say to me, okay, we're going to eat some food now or have a snack. Would you, would you pray over our food? Do you understand that I have prayed thousands of prayers over food <laughs> over these years and uh, whenever they wanted God. But I have to tell you, there were a few times when people were in trouble, when people needed to help, that they too would come to me and say, you know, when you're praying, would you just whisper a little prayer for me? Would you include me in a prayer? Do you understand? I'm just giving you a little example of what we need to be doing every day. We need to live it out in the world. It needs to be lived out to, to those that are around you. They need to see Jesus in you. And if your life is no different than the world, then they're never going to know. They're never going to know. Your speech must be different. Your attitude must be different. Amen? Amen. If you've got an old mean-spirited, belligerent attitude, when you go out in the public, you do more damage to the kingdom than good. Amen? Be kind. Be generous when you give uh, your tips. Be generous. Amen. Sometimes they don't even deserve it. But I'm always thinking, if I don't give them the tip, they're going to say, that preacher is a sting. And so I just, even they don't deserve it, I go ahead and give them at least the 15%. And it's by faith that they're going to do better the next time. Amen. And just... Understand that everything that you're doing out there in the world, it's an example. They're watching your life. Live it out every day. Wherever you are and, and what you're doing, it, it, uh, it's to be lived out in our, our uh, attitude and lived out in our conversation. Amen. And you shouldn't be able to spend a lot of time with people in the world without the things of God coming up. Amen. I don't mean that you have to be obnoxious about it, but, but people out there in the world, they need to hear a word of hope. They need to hear that Jesus is alive and working in, in, in this world today. Live it out. Live it out. Don't just be a hearer of the word, word. Be a doer of the word. Take action. Let your lifestyle be a demonstration of the Lord Jesus Christ. What you believe is different. You're going to find yourself in positions uh, where you, you know, you're, you're just going to, you're going to, you're going to have to make decisions related to your convictions. I can't do this because I belong to Jesus Christ. Amen. I can't follow that direction. I can't do that. Amen. A lot of times on the jobs and stuff, they would do these little gambling things. And uh, I would always just have to say, no, I don't do that. I don't do that. I'm a preacher. Remember? I don't do that. I don't gamble. I don't get involved in those kind of things. I avoid it. Amen. Live it out in your life. Be an example before those in the world. How about in your appearance? I'm telling you, in the world we live in today, we live in a time where everybody has to be uh, embarrassed. And if a man wants to live a life that's pure and keep his mind and his thoughts pure... He has got a struggle on his hands today, especially in the summertime. And people are just dressing so immodestly, dressing in such a way to dishonor God, even to dishonor their own body. Dressing to live so that the world knows, I belong to God. I belong to Jesus Christ. And uh, present yourself in such a way as a demonstration that you are walking with the Lord. Amen. Amen. And I encourage you ladies, remember you have a responsibility before God and you also are defrauding men around you whenever you dress in a way that's seductive or inappropriate. And so uh, live your life out. Live as an example uh, to the world and live a holy life. Amen.
Amen. How important that it is. Live it out everywhere that you go as example of godliness. Repentance means not only are you transformed in every way and you're in a new direction, but repentance also means that you renounce the old life. You're following a new life. You say, no, that's not my life anymore. I do not follow that direction anymore. You turn from it. You turn towards God. You remove everything. Now, in many foreign countries, uh, there are actual physical idols that they have to clean out of their homes and, and remove from their life. While we may not have very many things like that, actual you know, Buddhas or idols in our homes, hopefully you would never do that, but there's a whole lot of idolatry in America. Amen. And we have to renounce that. Those things that we've put before God and before the things of God. One thing that is, uh, let me just mention a few things, materialism and money. And we know we all have to have some money to survive. But when money becomes the focus of your life, and that's all you care about, is how you can make more and save more. And some way that becomes the whole intention, the whole focus of your life. You've got to renounce that idol. How about beauty? Oh, it's an idol today. People are caught up in this whole thing of personal appearance and, and uh, spending all this money on all these trinkets and all this, you know, to try to beautify yourself. Beauty and all of this effort to make your body more beautiful. It's an idol. Amen? Amen. It's idol worship. How about sports? I'm telling you, it's out of hand. It's out of hand. Now, there's nothing wrong with a little game of ball, and I understand that that uh, sports uh, can 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 be uh, a good thing at a when it's kept to a uh, a minimum in your life. I, and, and I'm not saying it's all evil and bad. I'm just saying that it's people worship sports. They worship the games. They worship. Uh, all these sports characters who are doing all kinds of wicked and vile and evil things. And it's almost every week that a new player is, uh, and there's charges against them for some wicked, evil thing that they have done. And they're supposed to be role models. Amen? Amen. I'd say don't put those guys up on the wall of your little children or young people's bedrooms. Put something up that's going, you know, put, put some godly example up in their home, in their room. Amen? Amen. Glory to God. I knew when I got on sports, everybody would get all quiet. It's the truth. We're worshiping. How do you know that you're worshiping it? Because of all the time and the money you're investing in it. Just think about it. All of the hours and all of the time, it's not worth missing heaven over. It's not. Renounce those things. The things that have become idols in your life. My friend Gary Norris, who passed away just a few years ago, was a baseball player and a very good baseball player as a young man and actually was headed toward, uh, you know, possibility of professional baseball. He said it had such a hold on him that it was, it was, it was keeping him from fulfilling his call. And when he repented and he turned his life over to the Lord, he said, I really, I even have to watch myself when I get around a bunch of the kids or even at youth camp and we're playing ball, I have to be careful because that spirit wants to get back on me again. That same old spirit of idolatry, that, that love for the things of this world. Now, I've mentioned a few. There's a lot more things that, that, that come up in your life as idol worship and they need to be renounced. Amen. You see, the, what really happens when, when repentance and conversion takes place is that Jesus becomes the ultimate reason for your life. He becomes the reason that you live. Amen. Serving the Lord. Those disciples, when Jesus said, follow me, they had spent all of their life washing their nets, going out every day, catching fish, taking care of their boat. That was their livelihood. And likely it was their their uh, fathers and their grandfathers and go back generation after generation. But when Jesus said, follow me, he was not saying, let's go for a walk. He was saying, leave it, renounce it, turn away from it. You've got a new life, a new calling. That becomes your reason for living. Amen. Hallelujah. That's the reason 
that those disciples, even with all the rough edges and all their problems and their weaknesses, they spent those years with Jesus and He shaped them and He made them into followers, into disciples. And they're the ones who turned the world upside down. Amen. Hallelujah. What about your walk? Does it match up with your talk, with your prof- your profession? You say, yeah, I'm a Christian, but you're not, you haven't really sold out to Him. I think repentance is in order for a lot of us because we've allowed other things to take control of our lives. Let's stand together. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Lord, I know, God, that you have put your word in our hearts. We thank you, Lord, that you have changed us. You've transformed us. And Lord, that you've promised that you would cause us to walk in your statutes. Cause us to walk in your statutes. Cause us to follow in your judgments and to do them. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Lord, I pray that we would be challenged this morning to live it out every day. Live it out every day as an example to the world that needs to see Jesus in us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, we do thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord.